Welcome back everyone to Campfire Tales. Tonight's story, we are uncovering an encounter that this park ranger and his colleague have witnessed firsthand and lived to tell the tale. Stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss tonight's story. If you like true and creepy pasta scary stories, make sure to subscribe, click on that bell, and smash that thumbs up. Now let's get spooky. I was a park ranger. I had always dreamed of adventuring through the hills and woods with the pack on my back and a log cabin to retire to each evening after a day of rescuing lost hikers. Boy, was I naive. Still, I enjoyed the work for the most part. I got sent out into the woods often. Being a big guy and useful for the heavy lifting often needed in the quieter winter months, repairing steps and railings and clearing block trails. That all came to an end one evening, about six months into my career. This is the story of that night. I don't expect any of you to believe it. You don't have to. Believe whatever keeps you warm at night. I, for one, will never be going anywhere near the woods again. For privacy's sake, I won't use my colleague's name or any location. I quit the very next day. The fire in front of me crackled and popped, keeping the nights quiet at bay. I stared out to the left of a small clearing, just enjoying the comforting sound. In the opposite direction, my colleague, more tired than usual after the day's hike, had retired to her bedroll for a time and entrusted the preparation of dinner to me. I didn't mind. I enjoyed cooking on the open flames. Hearing that soft snore followed by a groan, I pictured her stretching, waking momentarily before another soft snore let me know that she had fallen back asleep. It roused me briefly back into action and brushing off the tired stupor I had been lost in, and I paid attention to the dinner brewing in front of me. The light cooking pot, larger than many would tend to carry this far out, was bubbling lazily hanging from a slender green stick slung across the hot embers just out of the flames. A big advantage of being a park ranger was taking a truck wherever visitors could not. It allowed us to bring some comforts, such as a pot before me and an air mattress that would be impossible otherwise. I was living the life I had dreamed of as a child, working as a park ranger in my home state. The mountain range that we were nestled between cupped the park from either side. When we were out in the depths of it, assessing and repairing trails in the quieter winter months like this, it was almost serene. I often pictured it like an embrace. Like the peaks and the falls of the hills sheltered the thriving bowl of nature from the advances of the ever-so-creeping urban sprawl. The upthrust earth warded off all the relentless grind of the modern world. These few hundred square miles were a sanctuary of tall pines and twisted streams. I had often joked that I had been born in the wrong century, and would have been more at home as a frontiersman panning for gold or hunting for pelts. Regardless, I felt at home here in the heights of the park. The big pines many as wide as an F-150 parked down below a short distance away, baffled any wind that was in the air tonight, and allowed the campfire heat to radiate out in all directions. A small amount of smoke rose lazily up into the dark blue night sky, so faint it appeared that the stars were blinking as I followed it. The glowing embers of the log I had split up earlier were bright orange, steadier heat than the sticks and brush scattered across the edge of the clearing. It was a moment of pure content. I sprinkled a few herbs into the pot and laid back against my rolled-up sleeping bag, and whistled away the next few minutes, appreciating the clear night sky and the colors deepened. I dozed, 
and woke with a start as I heard the harsh sound of my colleague unzipping her tent, brought back to consciousness again by the smell of the thickening broth. Smells damn fine, she drawled, her voice still thick with exhaustion and an upbringing in the southern states. She set up two aluminum mugs at the edge of the fire and added some water. Coffee made the lazy way, I smirked. We had hours of darkness ahead of us and she was still taking shortcuts. Bad news, I said. The coffee is still in the back of the truck in the side net. Hmm, was all she answered before picking her way back down the path to retrieve it, taking care in the near dark. I stirred out the dinner slowly, judging it to be ready and saw her click the small light and rummaging through the back of the truck for some fifty or so yards into the tree line. She was back at the fireside before she had noticed that she had left the light down below on top of the box in the rear of the otherwise invisible vehicle. The small blue tinged up lit the interior was all that could be seen now in the cover of the trees. The white and green colored markings of the forced vehicle was impossible to pick out around the glowing rectangular window. The night came in fast as the sun had disappeared behind the surrounding mountain range. Remind me to change out the batteries again in the morning, she said. I'm too tired to go back. I dished up our food and we sat in silence. Without daylight, the temperature plummeted. Not quite winter yet, but far from the wetter fall nights now. It was cold. There would be frost in the morning. It only increased the sense of building coziness I was enveloped in. Seeing the steaming mug near boiling point, I nudged her and she obliged. Cooking was my job. The preparation of coffee was hers. I watched her stir the extra spoon of granules into mine marveling, as I often did, how skinny her arms were. Where her strength came from, I have no idea, as it did not slow her down when it came to building and maintenance of trails the past few days. As she rolled her sleeves down to catch the hot mug handles, I saw the goosebumps that had risen along her forearms, and I felt them rise on my own in response. It's a fair shade colder tonight, she said, braving a sip of her coffee and wincing. I saw the regret of her impatience in her face and set mine aside to cool a little bit. Agreed. An early night for sure, I replied. I'm going to need to make room for the coffee. Dish that out, will you? I got up on my stiff legs and wandered over to the black between the trees to relieve myself in midstream. Something had caught my eye. From where I stood, I saw the interior of the truck dim light for a second before I turned and walked slowly back to the campfire. Your flashlight's nearly out, I said. It's starting to flicker. She disagreed, stated the flashlight was good and that the batteries were fresh. As she had only swapped them out the night before, yet as we watched, it dimmed and brightened. This time... We both saw it clearly. What was that? We said in unison. The light hadn't flickered. Something had passed between us and the truck. Something had blocked out the light as it passed. The goosebumps were back and a tingle ran down me as it always did when something stirred my imagination. Moving to the other side of the campfire to get a better look, I pulled out my own flashlight and scanned around us. I drew a close sweep across the semicircle of pines I faced. Nothing appeared amiss. Had to be a deer at that height, I mused. Unusual for one to come so near to a campfire and us being around. Could have been the big guy, she joked. He's much more noisy. Bigger appetite for meat as well. I laughed. I had been overly enthusiastic about my longing to see a Sasquatch when I had first started. The more experienced rangers like my partner had laughed and brushed off the subject at the time. 
My colleague, for one, thought the belief in such beasts was a matter of ridicule, though she had softened her opinion for my sake. Not wanting to ruin my fun, my desire to see the big guy as she would always mess with me, often ending with me being the butt of her jokes. Off to our left, deep behind the tree line, there was a sound like smaller rocks and stones had been dislodged from the steep bank I knew to be far away down the hill. I had made note of the crumbling overhang and was going to look closer at it in the morning and see if there was any risk of any spilling out over the road. I focused in on where I was guessing the corner underneath the overhang would be and tightened the beam of my flashlight. The beam narrowed and it lengthened. I could only make out the inside apex of the turn. I could, however, clearly make out the pair of eyes some 20 feet above it. I did some quick math, and took a slight step back when I guessed that whatever those eyes belonged to must have stood a good 9 or 10 feet off of the top of the overhang. More curiously, they had the reddish coloration more often in wolves or similar canines. I stared in awe as the eyes blinked, and after a second, they turned away and they completely disappeared. Neither I nor my colleague dared to move. I moved the beam fractionally towards where the eyes had turned to and nothing reflected back. I shivered. I could deal with mountain lions screaming. I had heard elk bellow before. This was worse. This was a conscious effort at stealth. This was an attempt to avoid detection. My colleague still focused on the illuminated interior of the truck now that it had been backed up to the tent entrance and was searching for something behind her. Draw your gun, she whispered in an urgency I had never heard from her before. Now! I reached for my holster and panicked. I had taken it off while chopping and moving the firewood earlier and now I wasn't sure where it was. Dude, are you deaf? She repeated wide-eyed and her worry clearly seen on her face. I looked everywhere and was about to tell her I couldn't see it when she motioned for me to stop with her hand. I stopped on the spot and followed her gaze. She was focused on a spot about 10 yards past the truck. I could not see anything because I had the fire in the line of my sight where she had her back to it. Watch our backs, she said in a low voice. I could hear the tension in her voice. I did not answer. My own jaw was clamped so tight my teeth hurt. I gave up on the gun and settled for the axe I had left embedded in the portion of a log that I had not broken up for firewood just yet. As I laid my hand on the handle of the axe to pull it free, I said a little prayer of some sort to some god and saw my revolver beside it, gripped towards me and I picked it up instead. Seconds ticked past as we stood a few feet apart back to back. I tried to breathe quietly, but my nervousness made it very difficult. I could hear nothing outside of my own breath or my colleagues. After a minute or two, I ventured a question. Anything? I whispered. No, she replied, but I didn't hear anything leave either. I swallowed and stepped forward a few paces, grimacing with each step on the moss-covered rocky ground. I could have been quieter, but the heavy solid boots weren't designed for creeping. To hell with it, I heard over my shoulder. We can't stand here all night. I heard her sit down and start spooning the broth into our respective bowls. I stood a while longer. My heart was hammering, and my appetite had been killed by the fear. I willed myself to speak, but I had a lump in my throat, and my head was ringing with confusion and questions. What, what was that? I shouted out. What the hell was that? 
I don't know, she answered through a mouthful of dinner. A predator, judging by the eye shine, but I couldn't make out the shape. Most likely a black bear. She took another big mouthful as I turned, still in the same spot, shining my flashlight in the direction of the overhang again. Not entirely convinced of her guess. Best thing we could do is to fuel up, keep the fire stacked and the weapons close, she said through yet another big mouthful of broth. Talk loudly and it should let it know we're here and not moving. It would lose interest before long. I sat gingerly on the opposite side of the fire to her and picked up my mug of coffee. The heat warmed my fingers. I'll watch your back if you watch mine. She pledged in a sing-song voice and then smiled innocently. Ain't no squatch sneaking up on us tonight. That's not funny, I said dryly. Oh, come on, she said. I'm yanking your chain, it's fine. There's two of us and one of him. The big guy doesn't use guns either. We have the upper hand. I shook my head and sipped my coffee. She meant well. The good-natured ribbing was calming me. I knew she was trying to show me that she wasn't as scared as I was. I appreciate every taunt and tease as I finished my coffee. By the time that I set down the mug with a hollow pop on the stony ground, I was hungry again and devoured the serving in front of me. Grade A chow yet again, she chimed. Appreciate it. No, I started to answer when, over her shoulder, I saw the truck's interior. Still lit by the light that she had left in there rise and fall suddenly. The accompanying crash caused my colleague to spin on the spot, gun raised. Damn, she spat. You see that? Nope, I blurted. The truck bounced. It was heavy. We shared a quick look of concern before turning back to the small bridge window below us in time to face the low, menacing growl. It ripped through the chilly air. It made me feel sick. I leaned over and dry heaved. I was quick to force myself back up. We were quiet for a long, long time. What now? I questioned. Stack the fire, she said. We stood as the logs I had piled onto the fire took flame and flared up, the orange and yellow tongues flashing and weaving. The area all around us had brightened, flickering with the flames, and we could see a few more yards into the pines on all sides of us. The white paint of the truck below us reflected dimly back at us, and the contrast of the bright interior blurred a little. Then, I saw it. I cursed and my colleague jumped at the sudden profanity, turning and cursing herself. What in the world? she exclaimed. Whatever was sat there on the roof of the truck was not a Sasquatch like we had been joking about. It was worse. Way worse. The abomination before us was hunkered on its back legs like a dog barking its teeth at us. Its dark color not giving an easy purchase for the eye to look onto against the darkness behind it. It was giant. Bigger than any bear I had ever seen. I had been across streams from grizzlies so close that I could smell them. This thing was bigger. As my colleague spoke, the creature tilted its head and cocked it to the left just like a dog would, allowing us to see that it's not a bear. It was more canine looking. A cross between a wolf and a monster from a horror movie. Don't shoot, I pleaded. Don't frickin' shoot. Don't shoot, please. I pushed her hand down gently, my own weapon pointing up into the sky. Imagine that thing pissed off. The creature before us, as if listening, growled again. 
I felt it in my stomach, and beside my colleague groaned. She felt it too. Not good, man, she said through gritted teeth. I could not answer. I was too amazed as this creature rose on its back hind legs to a considerable height of nine or ten feet, just as I had judged from the overhang when I had seen its eyes, before stepping casually off of the truck and landing onto the ground, still on its back two hind legs. A cracking shot rang throughout the clearing. My colleague, against my wishes, fired a shot into the air to the left of us, thankfully, and the wolf-like beast just snarled at us and stared straight into my eyes for an age before it turned away, walking into the night. I said, don't shoot. I was mad, and I was relieved. I was every emotion in between. Stack the fire, my colleague answered in a cool tone. Why? I was confused. She was pointing her gun away to the left at a 90 degree angle to where I had been looking. Why risk provoking it? You didn't see the one coming from the left, did you? She answered once more in the same cool tone. Stack the damn fire. I quickly complied. The rest of the night we stood back to back talking about what we had just seen. Thankfully, we saw no more. At one point, I reckoned I heard footsteps, the bipedal kind, echo through the trees. When the sun rose, we were quick to leave, not even packing. Just grabbing the more important things before getting the hell out of there. If anyone is ever in the Northwest and finds a shorthanded axe embedded into a log with black and red bands near the end, showing the initials M-O-D scratched into it, do not spend the night there. Just go home. Trust me. Well, I hope that you guys enjoyed the video tonight. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing as it will help out a lot. Click on that bell and smash that thumbs up. That way, you never miss another video. Have a good night and stay spooky.